Chapter Four, On Life. Winston sat at the table and opened his diary. He thought of his parents. He was. He thought about ten or eleven years old when his mother disappeared. She was a tall, silent woman with lovely fair hair. He could not remember his father so well. He was dark and thin, and always wore dark clothes. They had both been vaporized in nineteen fifties. His thoughts moved to other women, and he started writing in the diary. It was three years ago. It was on a dark evening in a narrow side street near one of the big railway station. She had a young face with thick makeup. I liked the makeup, the whiteness, and the bright red lips. No women in the party wore makeup. There was nobody else in the street, and no touchscreens. She said two dollars a day. It was too difficult to continue. Winston wanted to hit his head against the wall, to kick the table over and throw the diary through the window. Anything to stop the memory of that night. It was, of course, illegal to pay a woman for sex, but the punishment was about five years in a work camp, not death. The party knew it happened. Some pro women sold themselves for a bottle of gin. And the party didn't worry much about that. The party wanted to stop love and pleasure in sex, not sex itself. A request to marry would be refused if a man and woman found each other attractive. Sex to the party was only necessary to make children. He thought of Catherine, his wife. Winston had been married. He was probably still married if his wife was dead. Nobody had told him. They had lived together for about fifteen months, nine, ten, eleven years ago. Catherine was a tall, fair-haired girl who moved well. She had an interesting face until you found out there was almost nothing behind it. She believed everything the party said. She had sex only because it was her duty to try and have children. When no children came, they agreed to separate. Every two or three years since then, Winston had found a pro woman who had agreed to have sex for money, but he wanted his own woman. He finished the story in his diary. When I saw her in the light, she was quite an old woman. She had no teeth at all, but I had sex with her. He had written down at last. But it did not help. He still wanted to shout and scream. He was walking in a prowl area near a building that they had, in the past, had been a more important railway station. The houses were small and dirty, and reminded him of rat holes. There were hundreds of people in the streets, pretty young girls, young women, men chasing the girl. Fat old woman, dirty children with no shoes ran through the mud. The people looked at him strangely. The blue overalls of the party were an unusual sight in a lax street like this. It was unwise to be seen in such places unless you had a definite reason to be there. The thought police would stop you if they saw you. Suddenly, everybody was shouting and screaming and running back into their rat hole houses. A man in a black suit ran past Winston and pointed at the sky. "Bomb!" he shouted. "Up there, bomb!" Winston threw himself to the ground. The pros were usual right when they warned you that a bomb was falling. When he stood up, he was covered with a bit of glass from the nearest window. He continued walking. The bomb had destroyed a group of houses two hundred meters up the street, and in front of him, he saw a human hand cut off the wrist. He kicked at the side of the road and turned right away from the crowd. He was in a narrow street with a few dark little shops among the houses. He seemed to know the place. 
Of course, he was standing outside the shop where he had bought the diary. He was afraid suddenly. He had been mad to buy the diary, and he had promised himself he would never come near this place again. But it noticed that the shop was still open, although it was nearly twenty-one hours. He would be safer inside than standing there doing nothing outside. So he went in. If anyone asked, he could say he was trying to buy a razor blade. The owner had just lit a hanging oil lamp, which smelled unclean. He was a small, gentle-looking woman of about sixty, with a long nose and thick glasses. His hair was almost white, but the rest of his face looked surprisingly young. He looked like a writer or perhaps a musician. His voice was soft, and he didn't speak like a pro. I recognize you when you were outside," he said immediately. "You're the gentleman who buy the diary. There's a beautiful paper in that diary. No paper like that has been made for, uh, I say, fifty years." He looked at Winston over the top of his glasses. Is there anything special I can do for you, or did you just want to look around? I was、um, I was passing," said Winston, "and I just came in. I don't want to buy anything." Well, that's all right," said the shop owner, "because I haven't got much to sell you." He looked round the shop sadly. Don't tell anyone I said so, but it's too difficult to get all things these days, and when you can get them, nobody wants them. The old man's shop was full of things, but they were all cheap and dirty and useless. There's another room upstairs that you could look at," he said. Winston followed the man upstairs. The room was a bedroom with furniture in it. There was a bed under the window, taking nearly a quarter of the room. We lived here for thirty years until my wife died," said the old man sadly. "I'm selling the furniture slowly. That's a beautiful bed, but perhaps it will be too big for you." Winston thought he could probably rent a room for a few dollars a week, if he dared to. It would be so peaceful to live as people used to live in the past, with no voice talking to you, nobody watching you. There is no touchscreen," he said. "Oh," said the old man, "I never had one. Too expensive." There was a picture on the wall. It showed a London church that used to be famous. In these days, when churches were famous and people still went to them. Winston not why the picture, but he stayed in the room talking to the old woman, whose name he discovered was Chanton. Even when he left, he was still thinking about renting the room. But then, as he stepped into the street, his heart turned to ice. A woman in blue overalls was walking towards him, not ten meters away. It was the girl with the dark hair, the one in young people's league. The girl must be following him, even if she was not in thought police. She must be a spy. The thought police will come for you one night. They always came at night, and they always caught you. And before they killed you, before you ask. Them on your knees to forgive you for your salt cream. There would be a lot of pain.